Hi, all of you, and welcome to another OIC Sunday Reflection video. My name is Maikon Steuernagel. I'm the pastor at Oslo International Church, and today I want you to give you some tips on how to use biblically approved language for saying that 2020 was a rotten year and that life stinks. You can also read about it in my new book, which I have called A Spiritual Life Hack, A Hundred Ways of Blaming God Using God's Word. Irony is aside, this is what's going on. We had no appointed theme for this Sunday. Once in a while that happens, we have these breaks when we have just finished a thematic series and we don't want to just jump straight into a new one. And I've been wanting to revisit some of my older writings and preachings, so I was looking through my stuff this week and I bumped into last year's New Year Reflection. So this is something I shared with you when we were shifting from 2019 to 2020. And as I read it, I found myself thinking, man, I had no idea how this would actually apply to 2020. So I want to revisit that preaching. And it starts with the way people greet each other in my home country. One of the most common greetings in Brazil is, oi, tudo bem? And you may be meeting someone for the very first time. You have no intention at all of meeting them again or of using more than 15 seconds on that particular social interaction, but still you use that greeting, tudo bem? And here's why that's ironic. Tudo bem means literally, is everything good? So you're asking the person if everything is good in their lives, everything. And even if you cut Portuguese some slack and translate bem for okay, it's still either an extremely naive or an extremely ambitious question to ask someone, is everything okay? And the biggest problem, of course, is that as a rule, nobody's really interested in the question. Unless they are your shrink and are being paid by the hour to hear you talk about your life, they usually expect you to answer with some polite version of yes, so that you can both move on with your life. And our favorite answer to that question is a big fat lie. Tudo. (laughs) Which again means everything. (laughs) We don't mean to lie, of course. We just want to be nice. And we want to play out the social protocol in a pleasant way that frees everybody from the bother of actually caring, which is how most social protocols work anyway. But still, it's an odd greeting when you, when you think about it. And my favorite answer is, the average is good. It's, it's sort of a sweet spot between answering truthfully and politely. So it leaves people slightly confused because it's not the standard answer, but it's still, they're able to get away from me without too much trouble. It's somewhat sad, though, I think, that we don't give ourselves and others a bit more time to answer that question once in a while, even if we know that it's a simple but particularly hard to answer question. What would you answer if, if I could ask you this question today? How is everything? Is everything good? How is your life? Is everything okay? Well, of course not. Of course not. To begin with, everything is a lot. Life is just not that simple. But also, we're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic with generous dashes of political turmoil. I'm often wary of asking even the much more prosaic, how's it going these days? It's almost inevitable that it will lead to at least a few minutes of corona talk. Many of us find ourselves in this awkward place of being tired of talking about the very thing that is affecting all of our lives. How would we even start answering then the much more encompassing question of how is everything? Besides, not only we experience a whole lot in life, good and bad, but also our feelings about whatever it is that we experience, they change. They change in time and they change in context. Experiences that now brings, bring us pain may eventually bring us joy or thankfulness or just stop mattering at all. And it is not only our own experiences that matter. There are also the experiences of 
those around us, people we relate to directly or indirectly, but whose experiences can have a profound impact on us. Maybe we didn't get corona or lose our jobs, but people close to us did. Or in the least, society around us did, people around us did, people all around the world are suffering, and that affects us. There is a linear dimension to, to how we experience life in the sense that we experience it through time. But there is also a, a spatial, a, a lateral dimension to how we experience life. In one way or another, the experience of those around us matter. They are part of, of the fabric of life. Time, space, and also identity. Who we are and how we understand ourselves has a huge bearing over how we experience this complexity of life. So what does it mean to experience all of this as a person of faith? Does it mean that we try to put a nice spiritual veneer on whatever is going on? Does it mean that we go searching for holy ways of laying it out on God? And to bring it home, what does it mean to experience all of this as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus of Nazareth? Does it make a difference? Now, obviously, I believe it does, or I wouldn't be bringing all of this up here in this Sunday Reflection. But I'm not going to start with a, with a Christian perspective per se. I want to start with hearing from someone who had more of an ancient Judaic perspective. I want to start with a psalm. And I want to start uh, and go into Psalm 77. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The water saw you, God. The water saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Psalm 77 uh, lays out beautifully something that I deeply appreciate about scriptures in general and that I believe makes it so relevant for us even today and speaks directly into how scripture answers that question of is everything okay? And that is that scriptures and the faith it witnesses 
doesn't shy away from life and its difficulties. It doesn't try to make it simple. It engages the complexities and it embraces the paradoxes. And a paradox that is laid bare here in Psalm 77 is the paradox between a painful sense of abandonment and the experience or the declaration of God's favor. How do we experience God as we experience life along that temporal line? Is he always there for us? Yet as diametrically opposed as these two ends of the paradox may seem, the sense of abandonment and the experience of God's favor, they still are held together in the psalm. How? How can such opposing expressions hold together and not be a contradiction or even a hypocrisy? As I read this psalm, I recognize in it two other expressions which hold them together and which give this psalm its character of worship and of prayer. For this is not the ramblings of a disillusioned skeptic, nor is it empty declarations of a naive religiosity. This is a song of worship and a prayerful expression of devotion. And we know that because of these two expressions. One is the expression of faith. And we recognize it most clearly in verses 13 and 14. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. What's interesting is that we recognize this to be an expression of faith precisely because it is said in the context of struggle, in the context of not recognizing answers and of even feeling abandoned. And because this is said in that context, we recognize it to be a declaration of confidence in the character of God, a statement that God is good and that because he is good, we hope to see that goodness revealed to us. Which is very different from saying that God is good once we had his goodness revealed to us. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see, as the author of Hebrews puts it. So the psalmist, in a faith-filled challenge to his own doubt and feeling of hopelessness, he declares the ways of God to be holy and good. He does not deny his doubt. He does not deny his sense of abandonment, but he wrestles with it on the grounds of faith. The other expression that is Profoundly connected to this first one is the expression of God's redeeming presence in history, despite our perceptions and more profound than our perceptions. For me, it hits the chord masterfully in verse 19. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. It's quite surprising, really, that the psalmist would speak of the unseen footprints of God when recalling one of the most emblematic stories of God's intervention, the deliverance of, of the Israelites from Egypt and the crossing of the Sea of Reeds. But maybe there's a point to that. The fact that we don't see God acting doesn't mean that he is not acting. And also the fact that we know God acted in the past doesn't mean that those experiencing it at the time saw his presence clearly. Now this might be reassuring news. 
that God's action is not constrained by our perception of it, nor is his redeeming power in some way challenged by our inability to read history in his perspective. But it's also, it's also somewhat unsettling because we're still here in the middle of history. We're still somewhere in time and space trying to figure out life and faith here. Yet the psalmist is not alone. His experience, because it is rooted in faith, because it is rooted in the faith of God's people, it is not informed nor guided by his own personal experience alone. You see, the, the memory of God's deeds that the psalmist speaks of, the experience of God's favor that the psalmist brings forth to bring him hope, it is not his own in an individual sense. They, they are the miracles of long ago. Yet, they are his because he is part of God's people. I would argue that one of the most important anchors in our exercise of faith is this collective memory. The individualized personal memory, which is not the same as the individual's memory, but individualized personal memory has very little to contribute. And it can even do much damage when it is not allowed to belong to the body. It is only as individual experiences of God's grace and providence can be understood as expressions of the God of the people and the fruits of, of such action can be understood as benefiting the whole body to which the one part belongs. It is only then that these experiences can become expressions of faith and hope rather than of greed or privilege. Now, all of this is pretty much as true for us Christians as it is for this ancient Jew writing Psalm 77. But there is, of course, one more thing. One more thing which should be on the very tips of our worshiping tongues as the Christmas carol still echo in our minds. In incarnation, in the God becoming flesh to dwell among us, any notion that God might be just watching this human drama of ours from a distance is shattered. God isn't just the distant subject of how we experience life and faith in history. He is in the very middle of it. He is part of our collective memory and experience, not just as an object, but as a subject in the very center of it. At the center and also on the edges. His spirit ever present, both in the silence and in the abundance. We are part of a community, of a people that is defined by the faith in the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. A community where sorrow and pain and joy and hope have part in our experience and in our theology and in our worship. In the context of, of the scriptures and of Christian community, that overwhelming reality of time and space becomes a reason for hope rather than for despair. A hope that has in its very composition the long silences, 
the painful struggles, as well as the exhilarating joys. And a hope that is nurtured and is embodied in expressions of worship, prayer, and fellowship, of compassion and contemplation. If we are honest with the history of our world, the times we are living in are tough, but they are not particularly unusual. But if we are rooted in this faith of the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ, then our hope is honest, it is resilient, it is compassionate, and it is precisely where it needs to be. Precisely where God chooses to be with us in our struggle. And so we pray that the Lord may bless us. And I pray that the Lord may bless you. That the Lord may keep you and be gracious to you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you. And may he bring you peace and hope. Go in peace and serve the Lord joyfully.